Welcome, welcome, welcome to the second Sunday of Lent as we get together and come together and, and worship online and in, uh, here in the sanctuary. Uh, it is great. We are encouraged through Lent to wear the crown of thorns before we can wear the crown of life. And so we are walking with Jesus uh, as he is going towards the cross and we are looking at some of his activities that he did. And we hope that at this worship service that God will speak to you and speak to you mightily. Uh, we, that is our prayer. Uh, we wish to uh, give thanks to all of those that are here making this service possible. But uh, we just know that God is going gonna, is gonna to work greatly, uh, not only in, in our lives, but in your lives as well. But let's just go to the Lord in prayer, if we would. Father God, we give you praise and thanksgiving for the specialness of this moment. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our minds and hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me uh, share a few uh, announcements with you. Uh, first of all, we have um, uh, the course of worship service has been suspended, and we are looking at the, uh, the cases at Lovejoy. They're at 14, by the way. Uh, Jim tells me that, and so uh, we are um, we are, are going to be be looking at that, and and we have uh, we have to wait a couple of weeks before uh, we can do anything. But anyway, um, the trustees are taking care of that. There is a food collection uh, that is taking place. This is our March collection. Uh, you will um, see that there are different items there with the um, food bank going up 250 percent as far as their distribution percentage in any way we need to to make sure um, that we help with the food um, and speaking of food now uh, we have a new program called canned goods for covid canned goods for covid and that is to help us reach out to the community of lucas as well as our church members and uh, we are going to be um, doing that this afternoon from one to three and so uh, if you have any food stuffs and or you have some collected and it's just sitting in the living room or whatever and you're ready to bring it on up, bring it on up here and we will have somebody to help you uh, receive that and, and take that up. That is today from 1 to 3. And, of course, we do, uh, we're looking at our groundbreaking ceremonies um, and celebration uh, March 14th. Uh, that is at 2 o'clock. That is uh, daylight saving time, I understand, and where everyone can come together for the new chapter in uh, Good Shepherd United Methodist Church history. And so we are encouraged to invite our friends and family. Uh, it's going to hopefully be a very, very big deal. Um, <clears throat> mask and social distancing uh, will be required for that. Uh, let's just, uh, I'm going to call on Kathy, and she's going to uh, kick us off, you might want to say, in the call to worship that is going to be before you. It is Jesus of Galilee, the Son of God, who comes to cleanse the great temple to restore its verdant chambers to a house of hallowed prayer. Let us open the doors of our hearts even wider so he can cast our th out the thieves who would take what is sacred and tender and turn it, it hard as gold in a fist. May the temple within us be a refuge where doves of peace roost in the rafters. May it be a garden that bears the fruits of a generous spirit. O Lord, take what is corrupt and withered and let it, be, and let it break forth in beauty. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And stirs me so. What the high reward I win, who's the name I glory in? Jesus Christ, the crucified. Who defeats my fiercest foes? Who consoles my saddest woes? Who revives my fainting heart, leaving all its sin and smart? Jesus Christ, the crucified. Now who is life in life to me? Who the death of death will be? Who will place me on his right? With the countless hosts of life, Jesus Christ the crucified. 
that great thing I know This delights and stirs me so Faith in Him who died to save Him who triumphed o'er the grave Jesus Christ the crucified we go to the Lord in prayer, it is indeed in a significant time to connect and to, uh, to just be with God uh, for, for a few moments, but uh, we want to continue to pray for Daryl and Carrie and, and the family, Betty, Amelia, Cashton, Casey, Donna, Donnie, and Donna, we want to pray for her, and of course husband Bill. Let us be called to uh, our prayer time together. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children Send us love, send us power, send us praise. Most gracious Heavenly Father, indeed, this is a special time of the year where we acknowledge you're going to the cross. But we realize that there are several things that happened prior to that, we realize that you were unjustly arrested, unjustly tried, unjustly sentenced, so that we could be justified. Father, words, our words of thanksgiving and appreciation and gratefulness are not enough to acknowledge the pain and the difficulties that you went through to justify our very souls. Father, we are so grateful for the things that you do on a daily basis in our lives. We are just overwhelmed at what your spirit does with Good Shepherd. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to minister to our church, continue to help us to minister to those outside our doors, that we may carry the gospel in some way through word or deed. And Father, right now, we just want to pray for those that have been affected by this pandemic. Father, we know that its conclusion is near, but we realize that there are just so very many people that are just having difficulty financially, difficulty food-wise, putting food on the table. and We just ask, Lord, that we can be your servants in this community and help ease the pain just a bit. We just give you thanks for your spirit helping and guiding us. And may we listen to your spirit. For we give you thanks for this opportunity to be your people here in Lucas, Texas. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us a special measure of your grace today as we share with others. Father, we ask that you would be with us as... We pray together, even online, that we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as they prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will hear a solo from Mike, uh, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, oh be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen and help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious omnipotent hand. We appreciate that. And, and how firm a foundation. How wonderful. At this time, I'm going to ask Kathy if she would come, and Kathy Di Giovanni would uh, help us with the Apostles' Creed and share together what we believe as United Methodists. I believe in God, God the, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Scripture uh, lesson uh, comes from the Gospels and where Jesus cleansed the temple. And here the words in the Gospels. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, Jesus said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna, son of David, they were indignant. They were indignant. May God add his blessings to the reading and our hearing of his holy inspired word to our hearts today. You know, we are in a sermon series, a sermon series called The Final Week, where we are looking at, we are looking at each of the days of Jesus' last week on earth. And last Sunday, we looked at the very first day which was the first day of the week in the Jewish tradition was Sunday. 
uh, being Jesus was a Jew. And today we are going to be looking at what happened on Monday. On Monday. And then we will look at what happened on Tuesday. And then what we'll be looking at what happened on Wednesday and Thursday and Good Friday. Uh, we will be looking at that. At our last worship service, we talked about how Jesus on Sunday rode from the Mount of Olives to the ancient temple on a donkey. We understand that he could have walked. Uh, that was only a half mile, but he chose to ride an animal of peace. And by riding a burro, Jesus fulfilled Zechariah 9.9. 9. Jesus was familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Israel, here comes your king riding on a donkey. You see, Jesus wanted to enter as a peaceful king, not as a military leader. But just as a reminder, the overarching theme of the entire Gospels is the kingship of Jesus. The kingship of Jesus. We need to uh, remember that, that Jesus was born a king, that he died a king. You remember the sign that was above his head. And then he was raised king of all kings. You know, I love the, the gospel of Mark. It's one of my favorite stories in the, in the scriptures. And that's where a woman anoints Jesus' feet. You remember that, that story? She anoints the, the feet of Jesus with costly perfume. And then she wipes them with her hair. She anointed Jesus as king before his death. And then the Romans crowned him with a crown of thorns, not studded with jewels, not made of gold, but they crowned him with a crown of thorns. And then they placed a robe on his back as a way to mock him for acknowledging his kingship. Soldiers did mock him and they nailed that sign. Once again, we were reminded the king of the Jews was right above his head, and so the kingship is very important. So that is the theme of this entire sermon series, the final week of Jesus' life. And so the three questions that we're going to be asking is, what kind of king is he? What kind of king is Jesus? And then what type of kingdom did he rule over? Is he reigning over? And the third and the last question is, what does he expect of his subjects? What does the king of all kings expect of us? But let's pray together before we jump into this. Gracious and most holy God, as we unearth the scriptures, help us to find Nuggets, golden nuggets that are valuable to us in our spiritual lives so that we can grow, as John Wesley said, in grace. So be with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week I said that we were all going to go to Jerusalem. That we as a church family were going to go to Jerusalem and so we're going to be doing that uh, via slides. And so I'm going to encourage us all to look at it. Now, this is the temple. This is the temple. This is what Jesus saw uh, as he was coming down the Mount of Olives. Now, to get your bearings, this temple is about the size of four football fields. Four football fields. It was destroyed twice. It was rebuilt twice. And the last time it was rebuilt was by King Herod. And this is a replica or a model that is in the uh, museum in Jerusalem. And this is what, as I said, Jesus saw as he was traveling down, as he was descending down the mountain, the Mount of Olives. And we are going to come back to this slide in a few moments. But please remember the courtyards on both sides. 
That is the Holy of Holies. That is a three-story building in the middle. This is where they felt that the presence of God dwelt in that Holy of Holies. And on either side were two different courtyards. And please remember those uh, in just a few moments. And now we're going to move fast forward. In that place, now in 2021, there is called the Dome of the Rock. And this is a worship space where the Holy of Holies used to sit. This is a religious shrine, if you will. And if you go out the front doors, you can, of the front doors of, of that worship space, you will see the Mount of Olives that Jesus descended almost 2,000 years or over 2,000 years ago. He, he descended down the Mount of Olives, we are told, and he set his face to Jerusalem. He faced the problem, which is something that we can learn, that we are called to face problems, look them head on, and that's when God's grace works. That's when God's grace works. Now, you can see the Dome of the Rock in the, in the, in the background, but you can see in the foreground, that is the Wailing Wall. That is the wall that was built by King Herod. It still stands. People come to this place, this holy place, and come here to pray. You know, I have spoken to a number of pastors who have gone to the Holy Land, and they tell me about the Wailing Wall and how special the Wailing Wall is. And many of us have read about it, and maybe some of you have been there. If you have been there, I would love to talk with you. But here is a little Wailing Wall trivia. There's Wailing Wall etiquette. And you are encouraged to approach the wall, obviously forwards, and you walk towards the wall, but you cannot, or the etiquette says, that you are encouraged not to turn your back on the wall. Because when you turn your back, you're to walk back 10 steps, and then, whenever, then, then you can turn. But Jewish thought is that when you turn your back on the wall, you're turning your back on God himself. That is just a, uh, an idea of trivia. And inside the, uh, where the, the stones are kind of uh, where they meet, there are obviously cracks there, and people take notes and they stick them in there. And there are hundreds of thousands of prayer requests. And when Cheryl sends out to the prayer works committee, to that group uh, that pray, I really cherish those, those emails. And I print them out, and I have them in my office. And I really, really cherish those and ask God to continue to bless those individuals and be with them during the difficulties that they are undergoing. But anyway, the, the, the Wailing Wall is where the glory of God dwells, you might want to say, and people do come here to pray. And then we will see, uh, you can see the Israeli soldier coming and praying at the wall. This is not just for Jews, it's not just for Gentiles, it's not just for rabbis. Uh, the Wailing Wall is for people of all walks of life, and prayer is a big element in the Jewish faith. It is a very big element in the Christian faith as well. And here is a pastor friend of mine, his name is Pastor Joe. He is in the Alabama Conference and uh, in the black shirt there and uh, Pastor Joe is uh, praying uh, at the Wailing Wall and he sent this to me. Uh, now, now this is uh, some small children. Uh, obviously I saw this on the internet. You can maybe see to her right the notes that are in the wall um, and to the left uh, of the children. But um, the Jewish people teach the children the importance of prayer at a very, very young age. And so uh, they are praying together. And now this is now we return to the temple uh, during Jesus' time. And uh, there are two courtyards at the left and the right. The courtyard on the left is the Jewish courtyard. And the courtyard on the right is the Gentile courtyard. And yes, there is a separation. 
There, there is a division, and Jesus wanted there to be no division. He wanted Jews and Gentiles to be together. And that tells us that the doors of the church are open to any and everyone. Period. End of sentence. The doors of the church are open to any and everyone. This is important. Now, these were massive gathering spaces where thousands of people gathered. And so that brings us to Monday. Monday, Jesus is teaching on the left-hand court, on the left-hand court, the Gentile court. He was teaching a crowd of people. And when Jesus taught, crowds gathered. People became interested in his teaching. And that's, well, he, he, he touched their spiritual roots. But there were three groups of people who got angry, who really got angry. First, the chief priest got angry. The Pharisees was the second group. They became angry. The Sadducees became angry angry they were just livid or as the scriptures tell us they were indignant towards Jesus yet these three groups the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked Jesus a question they asked who gave you permission to teach in our temple who gave you the permission to teach in our <coughs> temple they just simply said you're a country bumpkin you haven't been to seminary yet these three groups were just irritated I mean they became livid but not only were these three groups upset Jesus became furious as well. I call it righteous anger. As some people would, in Texas would say, he got hot under the collar. So picture this. There was Jesus teaching behind the crowds. And behind them he saw tables of money changers and vendors selling animals and exchanging money. So let us look very quickly on this Monday why Jesus got so mad. Why he just got so angry. The first reason that he got angry was because of the temple coinage. If a person wanted to tithe or give to God, they could not use their own money. They just they could not use their own money. They had to use what is called temple coinage. So there were money changers that changed regular money to temple coinage. And there was a tax charge to individuals. And the bottom line is that people got cheated big time. Because you had to use temple coinage. And that made Jesus righteously angry, you might want to say. And the second reason that he got mad was not only because of the temple coinage and the ripoff that, that existed there, but also they sold particular animals for the sacrifices. Now the vendors that set up tables had what is called Temple approved pigeons and doves and goats and, and various things. You could not bring your own. You had to use the approved animals. And they charged you a steep fee for these animals. And the people got ripped off. They really got the bad end of the deal. 
And this made Jesus angry. So this is what set him up as he overturned the tables. And, and after he overturned the tables, what did he say? This is my father's house. This should be a house of prayer. Now that gives us, good shepherd, an understanding of what the church is to be. We are here for a spiritual purpose. We're not here to collect money. We're not here to, to collect this or that. We're here for a spiritual reason. Because there are so many people hurting outside this stained glass window that need spiritual help. They need spiritual help in relationships with their family, in relationships that they have at work. They need help. But, the, the, but Jesus said, you have turned this into a den of thieves. You see, in the end... Back in Jesus' mind, he knew that the temple was going to turn into what is called the church today. And Jesus knew the worship of the temple would turn into the worship of the church today. And so the church is a very big issue in Jesus' mind. And so we're going to be looking at a teaching. Uh, last week we looked at peacemakers. We're going to be looking at another teaching that correlates with Monday. And that is when Jesus said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. We all know that. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, I could go into Peter's faith and uh, being Petros and the Greek, and I could go into all of that, but I'm, I, I'm choosing not to do that. But I want us to really think about that statement. Upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, the, the word my, I like the word my in that teaching. It is a po progressive, I mean a possessive, excuse me, not a progressive, a possessive pronoun, just like it is today. So please hear me, current members, as well as future members. Lent ask us a question, and that is this. Put your safety belts on. Whose church is this anyway? Whose church is this? Good Shepherd United, whose church is this? Sometimes we want to say, this is my carpet. These are my chairs. This is my the windows and we want to say that this is mine, but it's really his. It's really God's church. Yes, we are not to, to, to take ownership of his ministry and his mission, but it's the Lord's house. It is the Lord's house, and this belongs to him. But the question of whose church is this goes much deeper. You know, I remember when I was 26 years old last year. I just want to make sure somebody's listening. I remember when I was 26, uh, many years ago, I was uh, going to be ordained. And I was interviewed by the Board of Ordained Ministry. Now, the Board of Ordained Ministry is composed of 28 seasoned pastors. And they asked the candidate, myself theological, philosophical, and social questions. And I will never forget one of the questions that was asked of me. And that is, Wally, who owns the church? Who owns the church? And I was, they, they could tell I was thinking, but yes, he owns this carpet and the chairs. But more importantly, he owns you. He owns you. 
And think about that fact. He created you from the dust of the earth. He redeemed you and reconciled you through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the problem is we want to be independent. We want to govern ourselves. But the Bible teaches us a simple lesson. And the lesson is I want you to take this away. If there's anything from this, from this message, I want you to take this lesson away. You know, when we look at the temple, we are to re-understand that we are God's temple today. 2 Corinthians 3, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 3, says that we are God's temple. You know, years ago, you would come to the temple for forgiveness. You would come to the temple to receive forgiveness. God's grace. But most importantly, years ago, you would come to the temple to hear the word from God. To hear the word from God. Let me kind of close this down. There was a retired pastor. that I was very close to. His name was Bill. And he had a side job whenever he was 12 or 13, all the way to 15. You see, Bill's parents had a grocery store when he was a child in a small rural town. And during the summer, he delivered groceries. Two or three times a day, he would deliver these groceries. You see, Bill's parents had a whistle, and they blew it every time that they needed Bill to come to deliver groceries. He might be playing, and they'd blow the whistle, and he would come, and he knew that he had to deliver groceries. And he never, well, he he would always drop what he was doing. But one summer day, Bill was playing football, and was running for a touchdown, and as he was running down the sidelines to score, he heard the whistle blow, and he ran to the end zone, dropped the ball, and just kept running towards the house. Or running towards the store, excuse me, to deliver groceries. But if we were real quiet... Where you are, whether it be in your living room or kitchen, or for those that are here, if we're really quiet, we can hear a faint whistle. And God is calling us through our temple, through our church, to do something. Yes, we are to drop what we're doing. And do what we are called to do, to do our job, you might want to say. And that's what God wants us to do, is to hear his call. And for us to respond to his call. Because he's got something so special for each of us to do. Let's pray together. Gracious Father and our God, it is absolutely great to be your servant. It is absolutely great to be employed for you. Help us to do so in in a very special way that offers you glory, that offers you the praise that you so desperately deserve. Be with all of us here at Good Shepherd and may we respond to action and do what you would have us to do. For you are whistling. We are to drop what we're doing and we are to go your way and look at you and say, what do we do? What's next? 
And we pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to do that. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, we will share our offering. A time where we have the opportunity to give of our financial resources to God's ministry. God's ministry just, well, it needs you, your help. It needs your help to continue. And we just pray that we will be open to hear from the Lord. At this time, we will we pray about what God's going to give us or what we're going to give to God, excuse me. gospel songs that we have heard and loved and so let's you be sharing in that toe was tapping uh, during that time. Let's receive God's benediction. Gracious God, we understand and, well, we re-understand that we are your temple. You work through us 
You work in us as your temple. Bless us as we go, and may others be drawn to us this week. In Jesus' name. God, be with you till we meet again. By your counsels, God, I hold you. With the sheets of joy, I hold you. God, be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet. Thank you so very much for joining us in worship today.